Many thanks for joining us. Welcome to Business Incorporated on Channels Television. I'm Chimizi Obi Iwawo. Coming up on the show, Zimbabwe declares interim RTG's dollar its sole legal currency. Egypt seeks a non loan IMF deal by October. Plus, South Africa's AM plant expects 80% jump in half year earnings. First, the markets and the negative sentiment trilled the markets here in Africa at intraday with the JSC index in South Africa leading the pack of losers down 0.37%. Now, Egypt and the NSE index in Nigeria were also in the negative zone. However, Kenya closed positive on Monday, up 0.23%. And major Middle East stock markets mostly fell at intraday after the United States imposed sanctions on Iran's leadership, a move Tehran said closed the door to diplomacy. Saudi Arabia share index was down 0.73%, dropping for a fifth straight session Banks were the biggest drag on the index, with the biggest lender, National Commercial Bank, falling 1.3%, and Bank Saudi Francie down 1.8%. The Abu Dhabi index traded 0.52% lower, weighed down by a 1.3% drop in Emirates Telecommunications Group and a 0.8% decline in the country's major lender, First Abu Dhabi Bank. In Dubai, the index was also down 0.62%, with blue chip developer Emma Properties dropping 0.9% and its unit Emma Malls slipping 1%. The TARS index was down 0.52%. And in Europe, stocks traded lower in the morning after the U.S. imposed sanctions on Iran over the shooting down of an unmanned American drone last week. Well, let's get all the details of the trend in the European space today from my colleague there, at the Frankfurt Stock Exchange, Ashutosh Pandey. Hello, Ashutosh. Good to see you. Hi, Jimmy. It's good to be back on uh, Channels TV. Right. Well, the U.S. has slapped fresh sanctions on Iran. How are the markets in Europe reacting to this? Well, Jimmy, the investors here are cautious, and uh, that's the reason why most of the European markets are flat, either marginally up or marginally down. Uh, the, the, there is a sense uh, of actually moving towards safer havens for now because they don't know. There is this sense of uncertainty all around. So they move to safer havens like the Japanese yen and gold. Now gold has been performing exceedingly well. It's already at a six-year high, trading at around 14, uh, 1430 an ounce. And uh, there are some tra tra traders who say that they could actually touch uh, 1550. That would still be well below uh, the highs of $1,900 uh, per ounce uh, that was seen in 2011. So there is a lot of room for gold to move still. And remember, gold is also benefiting from the fact that the bond yields and have been negative all across Europe. And, uh, and, and that's the reason why gold, uh, as a safe haven, is performing better uh, today. Uh, Ashutosh, what about the U.S.-China trade spat? The Chinese uh, Commerce Ministry has said senior Chinese and U.S. trade officials spoke by telephone ahead of the anticipated meeting between their presidents later this week. How is that playing out among investors? Jimmy, I think there is a sense of cautious optimism. I mean, while they don't, they feel, uh, the investors here feel that probably the two leaders, when they meet in person, they'll be able to work some sort of a, a personal charm on each other and, and perhaps come up with some deal or diffuse at least the tension. Having said that, uh, the best case scenario that the investors here see is, the, is that they don't see that there would be a trade deal. I mean, not, a, I mean, not anybody that I've spe uh, spoken to feels that there could be a trade deal. But the best case scenario for them would be that at least the talks start again. I mean, the, the fact that uh, the top uh, trade official did make that phone call uh, uh, yesterday and, uh, and, and the Chinese Commerce Ministry confirming that shows that there is an intent. And the call was made, I mean, the Chinese Ministry was uh, uh, prompt to say that the call was made by the U.S. Side. So there is this sense of willingness uh, that is being seen here. And, and also the fact that they feel that they, uh, when there would be no deal, the, at least the talks go ahead and the fact that Trump holds back on uh, the tariffs that he has threatened to impose on the remaining uh, 
uh, imports from China, and that that is crucial actually because if he goes ahead with that, that could escalate matters again. Okay, Ashutosh, let's look at the Bitcoin and the cryptocurrency uh, market. That basket has been making a um, surprising rally, looking even ready to beat mighty gold in the current market volatility. Any idea what's pushing the crypto higher? Well, yes, exactly. Well, Bitcoin is doing well. I mean, they've breached $11,000 once again, and uh, they are at a 50-month high. And that's predominantly to do with the fact that Facebook announced that it will be coming up with its own cryptocurrency called Libra. And traders view this as some sort of uh, the fact that there is a huge tech company like as big as Facebook and now it's entering this uh, space cryptocurrency and that is going to give some sort of legitimacy to this entire uh, cryptocurrency sector and if I could call it that. So they feel that this is going to lend some sort of credibility and that's the reason why Bitcoin is performing well. It could also be for, uh, uh, it could also be, be because Bitcoins are seen as some sort of a safe haven, believe it or not. I mean, there are many traders who see it as a safe haven. And it, it, the, the fact that with the tensions in the Middle East, with the U.S.-Iran tensions, and the fact that there is a trade dispute between U.S. and China, that could also be actually pushing Bitcoin up. And also remains the answer in that market. Thank you very much, um, Ashutosh. Now in the UK, the favourite to replace British Prime Minister Theresa May, Boris Johnson, reiterates his threat to take the UK out of the European Union in October with or without agreeing a deal with the bloc. For details of these and more, let's talk to my colleague of London, London studios, Simon. Hello, Simon. Good afternoon. Well, UK Digital Bank Monzo has been raising funds left, right, and center, looking at valuation of close to $2.5 billion. Any idea where this specialized bank is going next and perhaps what is driving it? Yeah, good afternoon, Chile. Yeah, this is the fast-growing UK-based challenger bank with more than 2 million account holders. And as you said, it's raised £113 million in new funding. This is the Series F round. It's led by Y Combinator's continuity growth funding, gives the company a new £2 billion post-money valuation. That's double the £1 billion valuation it had in October last year. A number of other new and existing investors have also participated in the rounds. They include Latitude, General Catalyst, Stripe, Passion Capital and Orange Digital Ventures. Meanwhile, Monzo's new funding round and YAC's backing should be viewed, I think, within the context of not only the fast growth and increasingly convincing product market fit here in the UK, but the Challenger Bank is also currently adding 200,000 new sign-ups for its current account each month. It's also recently unveiled plans to launch across the pond. So you ask, where is it going next, Jimmy? It looks like expansion to the US is the next place. The launch is being done in partnership with a local bank there, but in the longer term, Monzo does plan to apply for its own US bank license, similar to the uh, one that it uses here in the UK. Mm -hmm. All right, Simon, let's speak to the Brexit debate. Frontrunner Boris Johnson has been defending his own plans for the October departure deadline. Can you show me the money in Mr. Johnson's proposal? Yeah, so Boris says he does not believe for a second that the UK would leave without a deal. He said he would not rest until the UK had left the EU, insisting Brexit will happen on the 31st of October, come what may do or die, were his words. But as so often with Boris, he hasn't really fleshed this out with much detail. It's mainly rhetoric he's relying on to convince people. So he's insisted, he's claiming it is possible to broker a new deal with the EU before the end of October because the political landscape has changed, he says, in the UK and on the continent since the last deadline passed of March the 31st. By that, what he means is a number of elections, including the EU election, um, which have thrown up Eurosceptic parties doing particularly well. Uh, he says that this has changed a lot of things. Whether this is in fact true or more wishful thinking uh, remains to be seen. So how is Tuesday intraday pacing out on UK markets? Well, with fears over yet more sanctions thrown at Iran by the US and what appears to be a complete breakdown of diplomatic talks between Donald Trump and his counterpart in the Gulf, 
it is unsurprising the markets are down here today like in the rest of Europe, really. Uh, investors also worrying about how the meeting between Donald Trump and Xi Jinping may pan out on Friday at the G20 summit meeting. The FTSE All Share is down 0.24%, the FTSE 100 down a similar amount by 0.22%, and the FTSE 250 has slipped by 0.34%, turning to the currencies and the pound is doing okay today, maybe helped by comments from Boris Johnson, who many expect to be the next Prime Minister, saying that he does not believe for a moment that a no-deal Brexit will take place. The pound is up slightly on the dollar and slightly more on the euro. It is, however, down 0.18% on the yen. Jimmy. All right, Simon, we'll continue to follow up on those market developments. Enjoy the rest of the day. And stocks in Asia slipped today while investors looked towards a meeting between U.S. President Donald Trump and Chinese President Xi Jinping set to happen later in the week. Mainland Chinese stocks recovered partially from their earlier tumble but still slipped on the day. The Shanghai Composite shed 0.87% and the Shenzhen Composite also declined 0.99%. In Hong Kong, the Hang Seng Index slipped 1.21% as of its final hour of trading. The Nikkei 225 in Japan slipped 0.43%, while the Tropics shared 0.27% to finish its trading day at 1,543.49. Over in the South Korea, the Kospi ended its trading day 0.22%, while Australia's ASX 200 closed 0.11% lower. In the U.S. stock index futures were mixed in the morning amid expectations of more dovish talk from the Federal Reserve. At around 4.50 a.m. Eastern Time, Dow futures slipped 17 points, indicating a positive open of more than 9 points. Futures on the S&P and Nasdaq were both seen slightly lower. Our market focus is largely attuned to the U.S. Central Bank, with no less than five Fed policymakers, including Chair Jerome Powell, scheduled to speak today. Investors are largely eagerly anticipated a meeting between Trump and Chinese President Xi Jinping later this week. The meeting between uh, Trump and Xi will be the first face-to-face -face meeting for the leader since strict talks broke down in May, leading to a hike in U.S. tariffs on imports of Chinese goods. Investors are likely to mo monitor a flurry of economic data reports, Philadelphia Fed manufacturing for June and the S&P for logic case Sheila National Home Price Index for April are both scheduled to be released shortly after the opening bell. New home sales for May will be released at around 10 a.m. Eastern Time with consumer confidence figures, Richmond Fed survey data, and Dallas Fed services for June set to follow slightly later in the session. And to the global oil markets, prices fell in early trade amid concerns over the outlook for crude demand, but prices were supported after Washington announced two new sanctions on Iran amid mounting tensions in the Middle East. Benchmark Brent crude futures were down 57 cents at $64.29 a barrel. They dropped 0.5% on Monday. U.S. crude futures were down 58 cents at $57.32 a barrel. The U.S. benchmark rose 0.8% in the previous session. Brent climbed 5% last week, and U.S. crude surged 10% after Iran shut down a U.S. drone on Thursday in the Gulf, adding to tensions stoked by attacks on oil tankers in the area in May and June. And to the metal market, gold prices climbed more than 1% on today to their highest in six years as the dollar weakened on prospects of monetary easing by the Federal Reserve, while simmering U.S.-Iran tensions drove investors towards a safe haven bullion. Spot gold was up 1.2% earlier in the session. The yellow metal touched $1,438, its highest since May 14, 2013. The bullion is headed for a sixth consecutive session of gains. U.S. gold futures jumped to 1.6%. Among other precious metals, silver rose 0.3% and platinum gained 0.3%. Palladium climbed 0.2% after his entire since March. When we come back, we look into the domestic commodities market. Do stay with us.